Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much, Sarah, for the kind introduction. Um, it's always good to be called a boss. It doesn't always feel like that, but that's okay. So to begin our discussion this morning, I want to talk briefly about where we at Shell see the energy industry headed. I would then like to touch on the critical role of partnerships, technology and innovation, because in meeting the future energy challenge, they will be absolutely crucial. At Shell, as you may know, we are constantly analyzing global trends to get a better handle on the future and to help us make better decisions. For four decades now, the job of our in-house in scenario team has been to look towards the future with an independent, unbiased eye, not influenced by the leadership of Shell. Scenarios help us think more strategically by giving us a better sense of challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. In its latest report, the Shell Scenario team analyzes how economic, social and political forces might play uh, out through this century. The report examines two divergent views of how the future could unfold and what that could mean for the global energy system. So keep in mind these are scenarios, these are not predictions. The direction the world takes will depend largely on decisions being made now and in this decade. In one scenario, political and economic power structures around the world remain relatively static. Central governments maintain tight control over policies and planning. There is not a lot of economic mobility, innovation or growth. But there is stability and, ironically, a more coordinated global effort to reduce greenhouse emissions. That's because of policies that encourage the use of abundant natural gas reserves combined with large-scale public investments in carbon capture and storage. In the other scenario, dynamic and diffuse markets and political forces do dominate. The economic growth for everyone, but in turbulent, uncontrolled ways that make coordinated policies on energy and climate change very difficult. Demand for energy, any energy, skyrockets. Growth in the use of cheap, available, but CO2 intensive coal continues. Only later, around mid-century, does the climate crisis finally force a shift into alternative energy sources like solar and wind. In both of these scenarios, by 35, 2035, we anticipate the world's renewable energy sources growing by around 60% or more. Yet in each scenario, fossil fuels are still likely to meet about 60% of global energy demand by 2060. The fossil fuel percentage remains relatively high because demand is expected to grow so sharply over the next 50 years. That's down from 80% today, but we are talking about the smallest side, slice of a much larger pie. So the demand for fossil fuels will remain strong. So kind of that's of the two minute version of, uh, of our scenarios. You can download them if you want to spend more time on it. But I hope it at least gives you a glimpse of how all of us in this room need to be thinking about the future. Our challenge as energy companies is to continue providing enough affordable energy to meet the demands of a rapidly growing population and to help sustain rising prosperity in the developing world. At the same time, we must find ways to mitigate the added stresses this rising demand and prosperity are putting not only on our energy resources, but on our water and food systems and our climate. By 2030, we expect demand for energy, water and food to have risen by 40 to 50%. And 2030 is not that far off. Just remember, a baby born today will graduate secondary school in 2030. 
It's clear energy, water and food will need to be carefully managed together. We need to understand all the potential linkages between them and the impacts that one use has on the other. Only then we can actually make the right decisions. So how do we, the NOCs and the IOCs, address such complex, global and critical set of challenges? Three fundamental elements are needed. This is partnership, this is technology and this is innovation. The reality really is that no company, so no one company can go it alone today. The scale of the future energy challenge is just too big. Strong partnerships and effective collaboration are essential. Obviously partnerships between IOCs and NOCs uh, are part of that. But I'm also talking about stronger partnerships with governments, academia and groups in civil society that have a stake in our energy system and the environment. In addition, partnerships across industry boundaries are more and more needed to address the increasing stresses on all of our natural resources, the water, food and energy, such as add metals including. Shell has a long tradition in partnering and collaborating with NOCs and also other IOCs. In recent years, those partnerships have grown much deeper, more ambitious and more strategic. We are also increasingly partnering with leading companies in industries outside natural resources. For example, in IT, in aerospace and even in video rendering to help us develop advanced technologies. Those companies that truly embrace new technology and innovation will lead us into this new energy future. In part, that's because many of the world's remaining resources are in more challenging and remote areas. So let me give you a couple of examples. I guess you all have heard about floating liquefied natural gas, LNG. A facility that can tap, process, store and transfer liquid fight natural gas at sea. As I speak, the hull of the Shell's Prelude floating LNG vessel is being built at the shipyard, at a shipyard in South Korea. When completed, it is expected to be the world's largest floating offshore facility. It will be used to tap the Prelude gas field in Australia, which is 200 kilometers offshore. A field too small and too remote to be economically developed in the traditional way. So this technology floating LNG opens up new opportunities for countries looking to develop their gas resources. It eliminates the need to devote land and pipelines to process LNG onshore. And it holds the promise to unlock reserves that are far offshore or otherwise will not be tapped due to their size. Let me use another example which is a partnership with China National Petroleum Corporation to deploy an entirely new drilling concept that will initially be used on our Arrow coal bed methane project in Australia. It is called the Sirius Well Manufacturing System. Now Sirius eliminates the need for big multi-purpose rigs. Instead the system uses a series of small mobile computer controlled rigs each designed for a specific task. It will allow, allow us to drill faster, more consistent wells at lower costs and on a significantly smaller footprint, reducing the impact on farmland. So this is not just on CBM, you can use the same for shale gas and light tide oil. Here is another example, this one from the other side of the world. I'm going to Qatar now where again a partnership with an NOC like Qatar Petroleum we are converting gas into liquid fuels and chemicals feedstock. This is our massive pearls gas to liquids plant. It's a 19 billion dollar investment and that was the culmination of more than three decades, 30 years of research and refinement to perfect this technology. For countries like Qatar with vast reserves of gas, gas to liquids technology provides a way to get more value from their resources. 
Pearl is also an example of how an integrated energy company like Shell can bring tremendous knowledge, resources and innovation to a mega project throughout the whole value chain, so from the molecules to the end consumer. We have the ability to take on big, bold projects and see them through. Now, each of these achievements resulted from developing technologies to overcome obstacles, then drawing upon our decades of operational experience to make it work, and finally actually work together with partners, like in the case of uh, China and Qatar, and there are many more in the world. I think this is something we as Shell can bring to the table when we talk about partnerships and collaboration for the next few decades to deal with the energy challenge which is around us. Also in all these cases, and we should not forget that, we are using local talent and support programs to develop local small and medium sized businesses as suppliers. So our intent is clearly to make our projects profitable, not only for Shell and our partner, but also the other partners, society, other business people within the country. And I think this is in today's world, with what's going around us in some countries, at the moment we speak, uh, use on un um, um, unemployment, etc., needs to be tackled as well. We also work hard to help develop the local and regional economies creating growth that will pay dividends for many years to come. Just some introductory words, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. In a minute, we'll hear from Helga Lund. I'm just going to take the opportunity to pick up on something that you said there. You, you paint these two scenarios. Uh, one is a very benign one, where everything's stable and governments are knuckling down to the business of dealing with climate change. And even in that one, you think the reliance on fossil fuels is huge. I mean, what you quantify it as 60% of our needs. Yes. I mean, the demand for energy over the next few decades, as we are adding 2 billion people to the planet, and as we are moving a lot of um, uh, societies out of poverty into the middle class, so we are dealing with a much larger middle class, this will mean this, uh, a very intensive energy okay. um, uh, part of life, and therefore uh, all energy sources more or less need to be developed. Okay, as just as, as an oil boss, I can see why the, you might be quite happy and relaxed about that. As, it, as a human, I mean, is it something that you just think, look, this is realistic, this is what's going to happen, and there will be some other way to mitigate the effects of that? Okay, I don't like the oil boss. Um, <laughs> I think we are... Because oil bosses aren't human. <laughs> <laughs> we are an energy company at the end. I think the challenge which we have uh, around the world is to build an energy system which has a, lo uh, a lower carbon footprint. And I think that's a huge challenge. And we can't just switch from today to tomorrow. Uh, we need to develop the oil and gas resources whilst at the same time we are developing the renewables, for example, solar and wind. But let me also be clear, solar and wind is mainly for the electricity market. If you take 2010, only 18% of the total energy mix across the world was actually electricity driven. So there is a huge other energy consumption which the, this engine needs to be filled and therefore we need to develop current forms of energy in a lower carbon way whilst at the same time actually building the renewables. The growth of renewables will be astronomical. It will be. It will be. It will get to, um, as I said, it will be 60% growth up to the mid-30s. It could be um, even 100% uh, so could double by 2050, 60. So this is huge. Now, having solar and wind in more um, let's say where you have got uh, space like the desert or like some open other areas, then it's possible. But if you actually go more to more uh, higher population density, the use of land, for example, for renewables also needs to be taken into account. So you need to have a lot of investments that this works. It will work. So therefore, we have to do both. Okay. And in doing both, I wonder if you say you make the point about reducing the carbon footprint. Do you just presume the answer is going to be the mitigating factors like carbon uh, capture and storage? I think that's one big piece of it. But the other one, I think, is as uh, as I tried to say, is to switch from coal to gas, which gives you a, an immediate and fast um, um, reduction 
reduction in, in carbon uh, dioxide. And uh, <coughs> when we were chatting just before, I immediately referred to it as a bridge fuel. No, it's a destination fuel because the wind and the wind is not always blowing, the sun is not always shining, so you will need something in addition to the renewables which can actually complement it. And therefore you need something where you can have power generation capacity which you can turn on and off. So those and who say, gas. look, look, this whole move towards gas and the focus on gas, it's wrong. It's the wrong investment, the wrong focus, because you're still you're head taking us in the wrong direction. We should be putting all that in renewables. What do you say to them? It, what I say is exactly that. It needs both of them, you know, as a combination to deliver the future energy system on, on the electricity side. Because renewables alone um, will, not, will not deliver on a constant basis uh, the electricity unless we find a way to store electricity. Now, if that will be a major breakthrough on R&D, if you can do that, but that's, that's not the case yet, and therefore you need a combination of the okay. two. Okay, well, we're going to hear from Helga Lund in just a minute, but just before we do, is there a problem with the communication with the rest of the world, between the industry and the rest of the world, in terms of tackling this huge problem? Yeah, you have got, let's say, at the more strategic level, I think, Going on the renewables <coughs> and not making the case for the other side, I think there are certain problems. We have not been um, communicating, and that means really the governments and the industries in the right way to actually uh, tell the world what is technically possible and what we can do. What are the impacts of these things? And shale gas, and we have talked about this in the past as well. On shale gas, I think we were just too, or, and tight oil is the same, we were just too late. Uh, we didn't actually brief the people correctly uh, early on in order to deal with some of the emotional issues. And I think we need to get better in general to actually pass those messages. But we, let me also say, the last few years, the short-termism of policymakers has also been a, a quite a tremendous obstacle in this because what we can't have as an industry is short-term changes, regulations, because we invest for 30, 40 years. Give us an example of the short-termism of policymakers. I think the European energy policy is most probably the best example because it doesn't work. So you see that by running in one direction on the renewable side, um, which is quite expensive then because of subsidies, on the other side there is now an increased coal um, import because cheap coal is available in the US as they are switching into gas. That means that most countries in Europe now have a higher CO2 balance than before. And, and therefore that Could is... Do you blame the actual policies for that? Uh, it's the incentives you set through subsidies and you don't have uh, the right target. So, so the European policy is responsible for increasing carbon emissions? No, that, that, that's now a Sarah Montague kind of challenge which leads to headlines. I think that's wrong. So the point is that the policy needs to be set in such a way that it actually um, drives the right incentives to, de to deliver the right energy components. So by setting a renewables target, you actually then develop that target, but you forget actually the other pieces. What Europe should do is actually by 2030 set a CO2 target and then we will deliver what it is needed to get to that target and that means renewables, that means most probably more energy efficiency and that means most probably gas. So you don't need to give the detailed targets, you need to give the right incentive at the top because I think we can work out the rest. Otherwise Literally, you subsidise. All they need to do is say set the CO2 target and then you're, the industry will step up. Yes, don't, don't pick losers and winners, it will not work. Okay, uh, well let's hear from another winner. Uh, Helga Lund is the boss of Statoil and Helga is going to speak to us and then come and join us and then we'll have some, some more questions and come out to the floor. Helga Lund, please. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Peter, for an excellent uh, introduction. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be here. I learned that the legendary oil man, uh, Jean-Paul Getty, once said that the formula for success was to rise early, work hard and strike oil. <laughs> And I think for a decade that has been a very valid uh, recipe. But as we all know, times are changing. Our operating environment is more complex, our industry is definitely more competitive, and our operations are more technically challenging. 
And I think also the societies are expecting more from us than they did in the past. As a, and as a consequence, only to strike oil is simply not enough, although it's a pretty good uh, start. I've been asked to talk about uh, the key drivers of the future of our industry. In 10 minutes is a pretty big challenge. I could have talked about the shale revolution and the impact uh, on uh, global supply. I could have addressed the climate change and policy challenges uh, in relation to that, or I could have talked about enabling technologies. Instead, I will try to focus on three assumptions that I think will be important for future energy uh, markets. First, as Peter already alluded to, demand for oil and gas will continue to grow, and supply will come from a variety of sources. We meet at a time where the economy makes the headlines. And the world economy is no longer expanding at a constant and stable rate of growth. We have been forced to adapt to a new normal of shifts, shocks, and also crises. I believe that the oil and gas industry has certain advantages in this chaotic world because oil and gas is actually embedded in the very fabric of a modern civil society. And population growth and increased living standards are two major forces that will drive oil and gas demand also for decades into the future. And all credible analysis that I have seen conclude that oil and gas will remain an important part of the energy mix moving forward. But the outlook for supply is much more complex. New ideas on old rocks are opening opportunities from Alaska to the east coast of Africa and also from Bismarck in North Dakota to Beijing. But we also see a continued uh, decline in big oil fields around the world. But also rapid changes in oil and gas technologies that improve recovery rates and allow the industry to develop more remote fields. And due to the unconventional rev revolution in, the North, in North America, two very different views on future supply have actually emerged. I call them the abundance school and the scarcity school. In the abundance school, they think that unconventional techniques used in North America will be applied globally, actually boosting supply much beyond the level that we see today. The scarcity school, however, they believe that unconventional resources will help to fill the supply gap left by the production decline in existing fields. This is a fascinating debate. For me, the bottom line is that demand will increase and supply will continue to come from an increasing variety of sources. My second assumption is that uh, the society around us will expect more from us. And I think it's interesting note to note that in 2011, the Time magazine declared the protester as the name of the year, illustrating the rise of public activism, the Arab Spring and public rallies following the financial crisis. And also in 2012, hashtag a word very few of us even know what means was the word of the year, illustrating a related theme, the growing importance and impact of social media, not only for governments, but also for companies. And shifts in politics and society are altering expectations also for big oil. We see a greater and greater concern for protecting our environment, environment and the health and safety of our fellow human beings. Recently, we have seen a profound debate break out over the role of big business in society. These movements, combined with new technology and social media, have created a drive for increased transparency. And earning trust is the foundation on which our business is built. In many ways, trust is like good manners. 
If you have to tell people that you have it, you clearly have not. Trust is not something we can claim. Trust must be earned and we must win it over and over again. And we cannot ignore the fact that many outside our industry do not trust, do not trust our ability to operate in a safe and, and good manner. And this is a fundamental issue affecting us all. It cannot be handled by one company alone. It has to be handled by us together. And our companies and our industry must engage with society in order to secure the energy supplies of the future. And our license to operate must be earned through operational excellence, safety and also constructive engagement with stakeholders outside the company. So transparency, dialogue and responsibility must be core principles going forward. My third assumption is to a large extent mirroring what Peter said, that cooperation and strong partnerships will, will be the key to our future. For decades our industry has conquered enormous technical challenges. But the outlook for upstream is shifting. The reserve base addition is becoming increasingly complex and unconventional. And this trend will continue as more co complex hydrocarbons make up a larger proportion of the world's total yet to find resources. As a consequence, the value of technology and competence will increase. In deep waters, complex reservoirs and harsh operating environments Exploration leadership, advanced technology and project execution skills are needed to find and develop these very demanding resources. And also in unconventionals, a more scientific approach and a more technology intensive attitude will drive recovery rates and value creation. In this environment, in my opinion, going alone is not a, an alternative for any company. The tasks are too big, too complex, too capital intensive. And to, to me, the best way to meet increased complexity is through more competence and also more cooperation. And we already see increased cooperation between NOCs and IOCs on the international arena, arena in developing new resources and also tackling technological and sustainability challenges. I also think that moving forward, the difference between an IOC and an NOC will be more blurred. And that's a statement coming from a CEO of a global and national oil company. We like to call ourselves an international national oil company in Statoil. And NOCs from resource constrained countries are joining the ranks of the IOCs in healthy competition for resources, developing competence and skills necessary to tackle our common challenges. I think also it's interesting to note that the uh, NOC's ENP spending budget for the first time has overtaken that of the IOCs. And some of the NOCs are now joining the major league. At a time when many of the IOCs are, are changing strategy to fight cash flow challenges, we witness NOCs growing further and becoming active on global capital markets. And Rosneft has become the biggest oil company in the world in terms of production. And I was told the other day that PetroChina's budget for the first time will outspend ExxonMobil this year. We foresee both increased cooperation between NOCs, but also between IOCs and NOCs moving for forward. A few examples. Angola was one of the first steps of Statoil outside Norway, and it is 20 years later still one of our most important international assets. And together with Sonangol, we are excited about the potential opportunity in the, in the new Kwanzaa Basin offshore. And our cooperation with Rosneft is an example of cross-border partnership in the Arctic, an area too cold really to go it alone. 
And we also see new NOCs coming up, for instance, in Tanzania, where we have made huge gas discoveries, and where we are looking forward to a fruitful partnership with TPDC in Tanzania. In closing, get up early, work hard, and strike oil. I think still it holds some fruits for success. But to succeed in a more challenging and complex industry, we not only have to get up earlier, work harder, but also do more than that, much more than that. And our common challenge, challenge is still to find, develop, and bring oil and gas resources to the market in a sustainable way, and thinking and acting on the long term. So th thank you for your attention. Before I come out for questions, I just want to pick up. I was, you talk about the secret of success, striking oil. Has shale gas been a little bit like striking oil, do you think? Yeah, I think so, because I think it's a, sorry. I think it's a testament of uh, the ability to this industry to be able to develop technolo technology and you know, work on the cost and efficiency so that resources that we knew existed before but was not economically viable to de develop now is opening up a whole new play. And personally, I do not think it's the last time the industry will do inventions uh, uh, like this. Okay, but how significant do you both reckon shale gas is going to be to the, to the, to, I, so let's say to the market, but I suppose to countries, to governments, to, to the world? Well, I think it's already very, very significant in the North American uh, context. I think it has the potential of also having a impact on uh, both the oil and gas market. When it comes to shale resources uh, outside uh, uh, the, the North, North America, yes, there are significant uh, deposits, significant opportunities. I think it remains to, to be seen how significant it, it will be in terms of, uh, uh, you know, hydrocarbons to the market because there's so many conditions that need to be in place. You need, uh, you know, efficient rocks, you need uh, industrial infrastructure. Uh, it's probably easier to develop these resources in areas that are relatively remote because you need so big logistics uh, uh, operations. And you also have to de deal with the, the expectations of the society and the public attitude. So for instance, in Europe, our view as in Statoil is that yes, there are resources, but we are less convinced that this will be a material addition uh, to the energy space in Europe in the a, in a short to medium, medium term. And that's purely because of public perception? Well. That also, but other factors as well. It's much more densely populated. Uh, it's harder to run efficient uh, logistics, uh, okay. um, you, you know, operations. And we don't know yet how economically efficient okay. it will be. Of course, it's had a profound effect on America. I mean, phenomenal, really, in terms of what it's, what it's making them energy independent. What about China? Because that's where you have some experience with uh, shale gas. <coughs> I think you're all right with your microphone, by the way. You should I'm, be all right. I'm OK, is this? Yeah, yeah. OK, okay. good. Um, <coughs> it, is it going to have as profound an effect on China? I think I would echo what, what uh, Helge said. It's too early. If we look at the, ge the geology of China, then we, uh, we can see the formations, we can see the structures. Some third-party estimates would actually say it's 50% higher than what you see in North America. We have drilled more than 20 wells now, we have uh, good flow rates, we are already producing, but it, this is by far too early. You can take as a kind of rule of thumb, in North America we needed roughly 45 to 60 wells before actually deciding that this is a commercial play. So we are still at the early phase in, um, in, uh, in China, but it looks very promising. Uh, it is slightly more expensive uh, because the whole um, the, the rock formations or the geology is more complex, etc. And the infrastructure, like Helga said, needs to be built still. So. Okay, I can understand why you might want to downplay it, uh, because you don't want to be synthetic. Again, we, effectively we struck oil. I mean, I appreciate it's not. Uh, but uh, it's, from everything that you've just said, uh, 
there's more there than there is in the United States. Um, we're getting it. There are good flow rates. I mean, it sounds extremely positive. It, it sounds positive. Um, extreme is a word in exploration you hardly use. Maybe the explorers, <laughs> but the CEOs normally are more cautious about that. I've seen too many things which then drop away because it's also unconventional. I use shale gas. You go up per well very fast to your optimal uh, or your top production, but then it actually the decline rate down to 20% is. Uh, after 18 months it starts and it goes very fast so what you need to do is you need to drill a lot of wells to actually know that the play works or not because otherwise you you invest you get some cash but then it drops away so in order to keep your cash that you can actually invest you need to drill and drill and drill it's just too early to say and explorers are always extremely optimistic okay. so I know and, and as far as the rest of the world is concerned because we were talking about this before you look at where is shale gas in the world is everywhere but we just don't know how right. productive it is. Yeah. OK, so we have this situation where America is at the point of exporting gas. Um, what does that do to companies like yours in terms of how you change your strategy to deal with that? Because the ramifications of that as to who's buying it, who's losing out as a result of them doing that, how do you both adjust your company's policies to deal with that? <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, for that question. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I think if you look a few years back, you had the, an almost extreme situation where you had, you know, two dollar per million BTU for for gas in, in the U.S. You had maybe 10, 11 in Europe, and 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 you had 16, 17, 18 in in Asia. So it was really an extreme situation. Uh, the way we think about it is that uh, we will probably not in any any time soon see a completely global market for for gas but most likely there will be forces that uh, to a larger extent link the different regional uh, uh, markets so that you will have a stronger convergence in prices that we have seen uh, before and, and of course in uh, in the transition period, and I and, I, and I also think beyond that, I think there will be a significant uh, value capture opportunities for for companies that are building, you know, positions within uh, uh, within uh, the LNG value chain. Because this whole thing about partnerships, I was wondering the effect it must have on your partnerships in different parts of the world it must have. Yes, but I think you need also to look at the total gas market. The LNG market has doubled every 10 years or during the last 20 years, and the same is happening now again. If half of the permits which are asked for in the United States will be built this, this decade, that would only get to 10% of the gas market in the world. So we also need to set this a little bit in, into proportion. But I think it's um, very important to have partnerships. And I think the partnerships are, you have two. You have those where you partner on the supply side, but you also partner on the demand side. So uh, and that's happening in North America. We are building one LNG plant in, uh, in, um, in Canada where we have got the buyers already in, in the joint venture. So you're starting to secure actually um, that uh, the products go to these demand markets in Asia Pacific. And let me just take one thing out from a pricing structure point of view because a lot is always talked how cheap it is in the US. When you actually take the US and you have, let's say, $4 Henry Hop. when that molecule is in Asia, the price of that molecule is also around $12 by then because that's the transport and the regasification uh, costs. If it's four landed in Europe, it's nine. So, and that's where the prices historically over the last five years have been. So I think we also need to bring some realism into this um, on what the real differentiator is. So I agree with Helge, some uh, adjustments, some form of Henry Hub in big LNG contracts which will come in, but it will not dominate because it's only 10% the total gas market in the world. Okay, and what about, you talked about uh, Europe and, and, and actually in terms of this, being open with the public and, and perceptions about shale, there is a great deal of concern about shale. How confident are you that it is clean and safe? What do you think the biggest hurdles there are? Helga. 
the, the way I think about this is that if I think about the, the challenges that is, this industry has been able to solve historically, uh, I, I think about technologically and safety-wise, I believe that, and environmentally, I think we have solved much bigger challenges than this. Okay, but I'm just wondering what the challenge is. I mean, is, the ch is, is there a very big challenge to drinking water, to the methane that's produced? Well, I think it's a challenge in the sense that the public perception is very focused on this. The implication for oil and gas companies, in my view, is what I alluded to, that I think we need to engage much more. I think we need to be very transparent in what we're, what we're doing. This is the only way, in my opinion, that you over time can gain uh, trust. trust, that we talk about uh, how we do things, that we show people how we actually do it in, in, in practice, how we drill the well, wells, how we secure it, what kind, kind of chemicals that they're using, and so on and so forth. Okay, but this doesn't sound like the oil industry as a journalist I'm familiar with. It's not one that says, opens the door and says, come and look at what we're doing. Well, I, I think, you, to, me, I to me, it is much better for the industry to engage with regulators, to engage with politicians, to engage with the, the public at large, uh, because I think then also the society will be able to develop regulations that are more fit to actually the, the capabilities of the industry rather than designing uh, regulations based on fear and not facts. So I think we, we are served well as an industry to be more open. I don't think we had anything to, to hide and be afraid of. And can I ask you both about uh, the vertical integration, which you were making a play of in your speech about how the, the, the positive benefit it was in various places, and you mentioned it again in terms of shale gas on supply and demand. For when you look at what uh, uh, Canoco Phillips has done and spun off, I mean, is that what, what are your thoughts on the various models? I think if you are technology and innovation driven, there is a lot of value in the value chain integration and I think that's what we have been pursuing for many decades and that's how we are, have been driving our technology and innovation and that will continue. But it needs a certain size, which means you have to be capable of actually investing along the value chain and given the costs involved, and um, Helga alluded to that, um, in terms of absolute capital spend you have to have, for a medium, smaller size company, this is no longer affordable. So, because you have just too much capital to spend if you want to play across the, 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 the whole span. So, you need to have a certain size to uh, have upstream and to have downstream um, uh, investments and still be conservatively positioned that the volatility you have in a commodity price environment, you can actually survive. So I think this is more a size question than actually an integrated question. Okay, so for those who are small, it's just the big boys who stay with everything in the chain, smaller ones should focus on upstream or downstream. And they will focus in certain parts of the value chain, but I mean, we are spending $35 billion every year. We are spend, paying $11 billion of dividend. That means we need to make $46 billion cash flow. That is just a very simple arithmetic. And if you can't do that, then you need to start to shrink your ca capital somewhere. Okay. Did you want to come? We're going to go out for questions in a minute if we get the house lights no, up. Very quickly, the, the way we have thought about it in Stuttgart over the last decade is actually to focus our capital and resources more at the key processes where we feel that we are best at, and that is actually to explore and develop and produce oil and gas. So we have sold our shipping business, we have sold our petrochemical business, we have sold you know, the regulated uh, uh, gas transportation network, and we have sold the retail and marketing network, actually because we think we can create more value longer term by investing in our core capabilities. Okay. Uh, let's get the house lights up so I can see, and I'm going to get some questions because I'm sure there will be plenty of questions here for these two gentlemen. Uh, there's somebody uh, right at the back, if we can get the microphone to him, and I'm going to keep an eye out while, if you wouldn't mind keeping your questions short, saying who you are at the outset, um, and I'll keep an eye out for questions, so do put your hands up if, and I'll direct microphones to you if you... Uh, Go ahead with your question, please. Thank you. Nick Coleman from Argus Media. Uh, a question about transparency. Both uh, Europe and the United States are advancing legislation uh, to make companies declare 
payments uh, in different countries on a project by project basis and this has been opposed by the industry uh, because apparently it's unfair because some other companies, especially NOCs, don't have the same, not, they don't have to abide by the same rules. Um, are you still going to resist this kind of transparency legislation? And if so, what does it say about your confidence in your own business model, which seems, I'm generalizing here, but the majors increasingly talk about value over volume. It's not just about getting as many barrels out of the ground as possible. Thank you. Okay, Helga, are you resisting it? Generally, my, my thinking and our thinking is that, uh, as I talked to in initially today, is that the, the society, I think, will expect more openness and transparency for any big companies moving forward, and okay. particularly so with, with oil and gas companies. And on that particular question with regard to payments, has Statoil been resisting being open, declaring them? I think we have been one of the front runners in terms of being open. Uh, and, 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 so you you've know, accepted it? This is, so we, but we, we have uh, challenged a bit how detailed that transparency should, should be to not make a bureaucracy and things that really are not advancing uh, uh, what the society would like. But we publish our taxes and signature bonuses in our sustainability report uh, uh, every year, and we think that is the right thing uh, to do. And the specific question about declaring payments, which I confess I don't particularly, I don't know about, he's talking about declaring payments. Well, I, I just said we, we are declaring signature bonuses and we are declaring, uh, uh, you know, the taxes and other, uh, you know, uh, re revenues that we're paying into, into every country where we uh, operate. The question is, how detailed should, the, should these regulations be? Are you going to go down to project level, and what okay. does that mean? And, here, you're not, and, you're, and you're not, you wouldn't be resistant or just on the grounds that national, NOCs aren't doing it or other local companies aren't doing it? Well, the, 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 the broader development, I think, is uh, that the societies will expect more, okay. uh, more, more openness. And I think it is a point that if there is more competition between NOCs and IOCs, I think this is something that all of us should think about moving forward and drive it in that direction. Peter Vosa. We are a founding member of the EITI um, initiative, which is Transparency on Taxes. Um, so we have always been very much pro-transparency. Since two years we are declaring um, the taxes we pay by country where we are allowed to do so. Uh, because there are some local legislations which do not allow us actually to publish and I think that's an area which we need to discuss in, in the broader sense on how transparency is actually dealt with uh, across the world and I think the other one we would share uh, the, the concerns that uh, too much detailed information is now asked for which becomes a very expensive and bureaucratic uh, way. Let me also say I think a level playing field in the longer term here is actually important because it will only affect uh, European and American uh, listed companies and not the others uh, from the rest of the world. Okay, gentlemen here in the front and I'll keep an eye out for more questions. Thank you. It's um, Alex Stevenson. I'm a parliamentary journalist. I, I work in Westminster for a website called politics.co.uk. Um, throughout the uh, history of the oil industry, relations between uh, governments, policymakers, and, uh, and the energy sector have waxed and waned. And I've sort of got a general sense that because of the because of all sorts of factors really, the current state of play is one of relative difficulty for those in, in oil and gas. So I just wanted to press you a little bit more on what you can do that you aren't doing now on transparency, on engagement. Thank you. Okay, go on Helga. I mean, you made, a big, you made a big deal of this in your presentation. Look, the way, to, the way to get confidence and the way to allow oil companies to, in a sense, to do what they want and to honour their commitment and, you know, provide energy that everybody wants is to be open. So, so, so where would you lead? So, Statoil's current position on this is basically, I think, developed uh, on the basis of our history. We used to be 100% owned by the Norwegian government as such Every Norwegian, they felt they owned a part of Statoil, so therefore Statoil 
has been historically very, very open about our activities uh, in Norway. Uh, that has been part of gaining trust in the Norwegian society. And we are tr trying to bring that history and that foundation forward also into our international uh, operations. And, and I think we have seen the debate after the financial crisis globally, not only in our industry, but generally, that the pressure on big companies to be more open, more transparent, is there. And it's a necessary foundation to gain, uh, to gain trust. But then I think it is important and that the industry need to be more successful in also bringing more realities into the energy debate. Too much of the debate is today based on how we wish think the thing would uh, develop much more than what is realistically uh, possible. And Peter alluded to also the implications of the, uh, the, the policies that we have developed on energy and climate in Europe is basically not working. So I think this is also a big job for oil and gas companies to make sure that uh, regulators and politicians and the society, society at, uh, at large do understand that you cannot um, solve the climate issue at the expense of people's access to affordable energy. You actually have to solve these two issues at the same time. And, and I think it is important that we are more successful in bringing forward that, uh, that message so that the, the debate can be more realistic and more grounded on facts. Is the answer, though, to get people to use less energy to make it more expensive? The key focus for us is really to bring forward affordable uh, energy. And if you look at what the world is looking after now, is is uh, security of supply, supply is reduced CO2 emissions, and it's affordable energy. And so, that, the, so there's just no business, there's no deal with politicians or in, environmental groups thinking, look, you've got to get people to use less, put the prices up. Clearly, that is. I, I think this is. Uh, you, you won't factor that. Uh, we know that supply demand will probably also uh, work in this area, but there's so many people today without energy, uh, access to affordable energy. Therefore, we need to increase the supply suffi sufficiently. And in order to do that, it has to be done in a way that where companies also have a return on their on, on their investments. Okay. Uh, the questioner was asking uh, Peter Voser about this sort of the tension with, I mean, he's coming from a parliamentary journalist, and I wonder if, Pose, after the economic crisis, you had this sense of perhaps, uh, I don't know, if it's a financial grab, whether, you know, the stability that you talk about, this wonderful, stable environment in one of your scenarios, is a bit of a pipe dream because everybody's looking for ways to A, raise money, and B, clobber you guys for, um, I don't know, for environmental reasons. Okay. Um. These are all short-term effects. We are in a long-term business. We have to deal with long-term volatility, and I think that's what we are doing. I think it has been proven historically that if the grab takes place, uh, taxes are increased, and we are actually in a country which has increased taxes a few times, investments immediately start to slow down. This does actually not the right thing for the longer term to have actually the right supply uh, available at the right affordable price. So I think we need to be very careful on what we do short term because the long term effects post the next elections, post the next two elections, is actually quite, can be quite severe. So I think coming back to the transparency point, if I may, I think Please it do. is extremely important that the triangle between civil society, government and corporates start to work better. Because over the last four or five years, I think that triangle has been completely broken. The trust effect, which Helga talked about it, is no longer available. And I think the only way to actually tackle that is in a very transparent way. So for example, publishing sustainable development reports, like we do, we were the first ones, that should help to increase the transparency of what we are doing. And having the reality discussions of what is possible, what is not possible in short term, is part of that. But I think we need, all of us, we need to work on that triangle in a different way. Are there any thoughts in the room on that, that anybody wants to contribute to, on this question of transparency within the industry? <coughs> okay, there's a question here at the front. Hello, Peter. It's Sean Willis at Terrapin. A question uh, regarding the, the long-term scenario planning, the long-term nature of your project planning. 
must uh, involve some assumptions around oil and gas prices, not next year, but in 20 years' time. Are you able to share with us your thinking on that? Uh, the base assumption in our scenario work is uh, that given the complexity of developing natural resources in the longer term and the stresses on some of the natural resources, and here I'm not talking just energy but others as well, will actually drive, in our opinion, uh, uh, the energy prices up over time. So we, our base assumption is we will need higher prices to actually develop enough supply to actually um, uh, uh, deliver or help to deliver the demand on the other side. So I think that will be the base assumption. Now you will always find companies like Stud Oil and Shell, they're extremely conservative in the way we look at this um, because we heard just that there might be a grab for tax, there might be changes here or there. So we plan very conservatively but now base assumption long term is it is going to go up um, and that uh, therefore energy efficiency for for consumers is a key a key deliverable in the longer term as well so that you can afford the energy which is going to be more costly in the longer term okay gentlemen in the front row yes I'm, I'm Nicolas Perrin from Early Kid your two companies have been leading companies in the field of carbon capture and storage with projects like Quest and Mongstadt how do you see uh, the perspective of this opportunity and, and your position as IOCs and perhaps some partnerships opportunities with NOCs in this field? Helga. I think a decade back there was almost a euphoria around CC, CCS and that was, you know, the solution to, you know, the, the, the carbon issue and the climate issue. I think it's a more balanced uh, view in the industry and uh, among, uh, you know, te technology uh, you people that CCS is still very important, but it's not the silver bullet. It will be part of a comprehensive response to the, 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 the climate and energy issue. Our company are working very hard on, on this. Personally, I believe that uh, what the industry needs is actually m more projects where we are testing different technologies to a larger scale. Uh, so we, we, ha we have built the first test center at Mon Mongstar where we sequestrate together with Peter and his team uh, 100,000 ton tons uh, uh, you know, per year. That's the capability. So it's a start starting of an upscaling on different technologies. And, but I wish there were more CCS projects around the world because it's... Uh, but it's only Norway's got any money to do it, isn't it? Well, that's part of the issue. And it's very hard to argue CCS as a long-term solution if it's very expensive. So we really have to have a key focus on driving down the cost for CCS so it can be available, uh, uh, you know, everywhere. You shook your head when I said it's only Norway then. Yeah, there are more countries who actually see the benefit for the longer term. So uh, the gentleman mentioned Quest in Canada, so that's partially financed by, uh, by the Canadian federal and provincial government in Alberta. Um, we do the same in Australia, not direct financing from Australia, but the incentives have built like that. So I think you see countries actually seeing the, the long-term benefits. We do um, R&D, so that's one example we do with other NOCs. We also to do R&D on that side, but we need the project and we are also one of the leading contenders in this country to actually drive a gas CCS project forward. So Shell has taken the view by now that I will not wait for a regulatory framework, we will just do a few projects so that we can actually learn and build the case on how to do this in a sustainable way. And, and, and there's no doubt it is possible to do it in a, yeah. an affordable way, is it? I think over time, yes, but there is a bot to that, and this we, I should have mentioned it before, the world will need to price CO2 at one stage. And when we price the CO2, this will become affordable uh, in a certain way. Now the discussion there will be what's the price of CO2, yeah. well, let's, let's see that later on. So, but that is needed, otherwise Can certain... Can you give us a sensible price on CO2? Uh, yeah, that's a difficult one. We use for all of our projects. Uh, we use $40 a ton, 
uh, worldwide. So no project gets sanctions without actually having that CO2 price built into the economics. And we do this now not just for the last 12 months, we do it for multiple years already. So we see this coming. It will happen at one stage. Is 40 right or not? We don't know yet. But at least you, you bring that into your technology. Current European prices are below that. Yeah. But let me also be clear, China is text testing some market systems now for CO2 prices. And you wouldn't expect that actually in China, but they do it quietly and move on with it. So I think... Um, and with success? Uh, what I hear, yes. It, so. Sorry, just, you, got, you can't just leave it there. <laughs> no, it is, it's, it's in two areas, it's working, but it's, uh, China is big, it's too early to say. We saw it with the ETS system in Europe, uh, it had flaws uh, at the beginning and still have some today. It needs adjustments and the Chinese will go through the same. What I'm trying to say is actually, very, you wouldn't expect the market system coming first from China. You would expect it to come from the US or from Europe. So I think the world is moving, moving forward. And if you get that, CCS in China, um, attached to coal, attached to other things, will actually take off, in my opinion. But, but to listen to you, one would think that the policy in China is far more effective than the policy in Europe in terms of delivering clean energy for everybody. Yeah, I never make a lot of friends in some parts of the Western world when they ask me which, which country has actually the best uh, in, uh, energy <laughs> policy and the clearest uh, the focus on it. I always say it's China. Because at least you get a policy, you get a plan, and they stick to it. But it's not very clean. Um, they cannot change from today to tomorrow because they have an economic growth, they have a but, middle but class growth. But the way we growth, are, it's very will interesting. Will they have a cleaner tomorrow than Europe because I, of the way they're going? Yeah, I don't know that, but they will have a much cleaner one in the future compared to where they are today, yes. All right. Yeah. Just on the, we should get back to the carbon price because we've got one more question to get in. Yeah, I think Shell and Stotton have a very similar position on this. CCS is important. It's a big technology uh, you know, effort that needs to be undertaking. We undertake and we engage in concrete specific projects. And $40 a tonne, is that the price? What price do you guys use? Well, it's, it's, prob it's probably interesting to, to uh, you know, the experience from Norway is that, you know, the oil and gas industry pays roughly $60 per ton in, in CO2 tax. And it has actually had a very neat effect in the sense that every project that has a lower cost than $60 per ton is implemented. So therefore the production at Norwegian continental shelf is very CO2. Uh, efficient, and we follow the same approach as, as Peter and Shell that we put our best judgment about. Uh, but uh, but the your CO2 best price. judgment is 50% higher than Shell's. Well, that was not my uh, assumption because I'm, I'm not going to tell you because this is uh, one of our planning assumptions. But I told you about the Norwegian government's okay. CO2 tax, which but is around 60 Hold on, the interest of transparency. I thought we were being very are, transparent. You here. see, we are more transparent than they are. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, why this is a commercial factor. Well, why is so if you ask me about our long-term plan... But if it's a commercial factor, why are you happy to say it? Uh, I can only say that we thought actually in the whole CO2 discussion, climate change discussion, we make it public. It's a commercial okay. factor, I agree, like oil prices, something. Don't help him out of the hole. He no, can say I, the price. I have to defend He's my partner, so I defend him, so that's okay. <laughs> this is obviously a freely well-functioning market. They're just rigging prices here. <laughs> Gentlemen at the back, better be the last question. Um, Nicholas Newman from Oxford Prospect. Uh, well, I was at the UK Energy Policy Day at Oxford University a couple of weeks ago. Can, can I just ask you to put the microphone right close to your mouth so we can hear you? Okay. Can okay, you hear me now? I'm Nicholas Newman from Oxford Prospect. Um, I'm an energy journalist. I was at the UK Energy Policy Day uh, discussion at Oxford University a couple of weeks ago, and they were basically very disappointed with the way governments were not doing enough to encourage investors in CCS. Um, they thought the whole regulatory framework, uh, policy framework, was discouraging uh, investment. So what more should policy makers be doing in Europe? for instance, to encourage CCS development. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you very much for that question. Can we have an answer in 30 seconds, please, from each of you? What do you want governments to do to make it happen? There is one answer to, that, to, to this in, in 50 seconds, and that is actually to agree on a sufficiently high CO2 price. Then innovation and uh, technology development will happen. 
So if one can deliver that on a you know, equal basis globally, which is politically so far has We can't even agree on the stage, possible. can we? But, but that will help because it's not picking technology, it's not differentiating on that basis, but it's incentivizing hundreds and thousands of smaller and bigger companies, universities to deal with the issue because there is an economic benefit from engaging and, and, and we have to have that. Nothing to add. Same opinion. Entirely agree. Set a high enough price. I think it has to be a high enough price so that project gets built and the R&D and the innovation side is actually driven by, by those incentives. Again, let's not set the wrong target, set the right one, give us a price, we will make the rest. Peter Vosa, Helga Lund, thank you both very much. Yes, thank you.